Cabin Fever Lecture Series for this winter. Um, our next one will be, check my notes, March 14th. It will be uh, Mosquitoes Suck, presented by Craig. <laughs> 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 it's right over here in the corner. Uh, it tell us about mosquito biology and uh, how treatments are done locally. So uh, um, I've seen the presentation before. It was really good. Um, and uh, uh, this weekend, this Saturday at 8 a.m. at Audrey Park, we have our uh, monthly wildlife walk. So if anyone would like to come and join us for that, you're welcome to come. We have motor binoculars, so if you don't have any, you can borrow ours. Um, if you're not a member, we have membership information back there on the board, and the board shows a bunch of the things we do. And if you'd like to sign up for our events email, you get one email a month uh, that tells you uh, the upcoming events. Um, so uh, tonight's uh, presentation, uh, Snakes of Vermont. Uh, I, I kind of we planned on doing this one a couple of years ago in the middle of the pandemic uh, as an mm. online presentation, and um, we were we were detecting maybe some uh, Zoom fatigue from people, and <laughs> uh, decided probably to put it off into now. But there's a reason why I wanted to do it. Uh, I, one day I was uh, looking in the police log in the Addison Independent, and there was a story in there about uh, a snake at the Charter House. And the police were called to go and uh, deal with a snake. Uh, they said a huge snake, uh, and then the police had killed it. And I oh, thought, yeah. well, that's Aww. wrong because there's no snake around here that you could be afraid of. So I figured we really need some snake education in this area. <laughs> and, and I hope you all will take, take your lessons from here and, and be little ambassadors around to tell people uh, that the snakes around here are generally harmless. So our, our, present, our, our presenter tonight is Jim Andrews. He's uh, from the uh, uh, Vermont Herb Atlas. Uh, he's been a uh, Otter Creek Audubon Society. Uh, were you president? No, no, never president. But he was been on our board in the past. He is a silver feather re recipient for the work he's done. That's our, our award we give. And uh, looking forward to hearing him tell his presentation, give his presentation tonight. So uh, Jim Andrews. Thank you. some of the lights on right here my wife will take care of it that's good that's, that's good for me all right let's see now if i can see my buttons i think i can no not that one that i like to start off with this slide because i know there's a, a lot of birders here and, and I get a chuckle out of it I, I, i've shown it to this crowd before or at least the audubon folks before and the idea is that uh, I'm taking over birds. And if, if you look at it, this is a common ancestry table. It's called a cladogram. And, uh, you know, here's all the four-legged creatures. And then these are the different groups that, um, the, that uh, a common ancestor here gradually evolved into the amphibians. And then a little bit later in time, we spread out into the mammals. And turtles, which are actually quite separated from, say, the snakes. Even birds are more closely related to snakes than turtles are. And, um, you know, back when I was in high school, one of my teachers is here, by the way. No, <laughs> so he wasn't talking about reptiles. He was talking about chemistry. Um, but, you know, back when... Well, back in the early 1800s when I was in high school, um, <laughs> birds were not yet considered reptiles. But here's the reptile group. And so now we consider birds as one of the reptiles. And you go, geez, how, how can that possibly be? Um, well, you know, the turtles branched off first. And if we're calling everything from here on uh, reptiles, then we got to include the birds. And that's pretty well accepted now in the scientific community. Uh, and so what we got to say then is the endothermic reptiles, those that are warm-blooded, endo, generating their own heat, and the ectothermic reptiles. So warm-blooded reptiles, cold-blooded reptiles, and herpetologists don't like to pay any attention to those warm-blooded reptiles, <laughs> the birds, though I do, but not because I'm a herpetologist. So herpetologists, interestingly enough, study turtles, skip the birds, and then they'll study the rest of this stuff over here. Of course, I don't get a chance to study crocodilians much, 
um, you know, southern crocodiles, alligators. Tuatara, you know, uh, New Zealand. Uh, so I don't get a chance to see that one much. Uh, Iguanas, chameleons, agamas, not in Vermont. <laughs> Getting over here, geckos and flat-footed lizards? Mm, no. <laughs> but, interesting enough, snakes and the rest of the lizards are really pretty closely related. And we have one lizard and a handful of snakes. Uh, and we don't have any amphisbanians, which are worm-like. Uh, worm-like lizards really live on the ground further south. One lizard and a bunch of snakes, and then the other one, whoops, wrong row, turtles that I can claim to know something about. There's our one <coughs> lizard. And that's a young lizard, that one. Um, the youngsters have this bright blue tail. And it makes sense that, that this attracts predators to your tail rather than your head. But why they lose that as they get older is a good question, because they do lose it. This is a breeding male, and uh, breeding males have that reddish orange head and a very, very plain looking body like this. And they're really very, very few places in the state where you'd be lucky enough to find them. If you could find yourself, if you headed down in, in the western Rutland County, found yourself a talus slope, a rock slide below a cliff, not too far from Lake Champlain, then sat there for a while in the sun, you might see in the distance <laughs> a lizard pop out somewhere. And take a look at our, our range map. <laughs> you know, that's right here. We got West Haven and Benson. You know, and that's it for, for our one lizard. It's a uh, high priority endangered species. S1, that skill, by the way, state heritage ranks, if you're not familiar with it, goes from one to five, with a one being the rarest and five being the most common. So, I like to jump to this one. This is perfect for you. You might, you know that snake. <laughs> and, and I go to this one because a lot of people's reaction to snakes is, is uh, like Ron was talking about, it, and it's uh, let's kill it, that kind of stuff. But I'm trying to show you here that this young lady has learned how to handle a snake. She has learned that that snake is absolutely harmless. And she not only can coexist with snakes, but she can enjoy their company. And she goes out and pokes around and looks for them. Of course, now she's out of college. <laughs> But I like the image of her being younger yeah. and coexisting with the snake. I, you know, if, if, if the example you show and that you teach is, uh, first, you've got to know what the dangerous snakes are wherever you are in the world. Uh, so, you know, you go, you go to Belize and you don't grab the first snake that you're looking at. <laughs> you've got to inform yourself about what snakes you can pick up and what snakes you can. My wife's always worried that I'm going to pick up something that I really shouldn't. Um, but in Vermont, if it has a rattle, don't pick it up. <laughs> Otherwise, grab it. You got that way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, go ahead and pick it up. Because um, the only venomous snake that we have in Vermont is the timber rattlesnake. And the timber rattlesnake is a docile, fat, a slow snake that most of the time is going to let you walk right by it. You know, I, uh, I've had radio transmitters on timber rattlesnakes and you know, geez, it's, it's right here, it's right here. And you can't see it and it's not moving. Finally it starts to move. They're so well camouflaged. Um, and if you were lucky enough to be anywhere near one, uh, you probably wouldn't know it. You know, you'd probably walk right past it. In the few places, the houses that are within the range, traveling distance of the dens of timber rattlesnakes in Vermont, we contacted all the local landowners in those areas. And if a rattlesnake shows up somewhere in their yard and they're worried about it, there's a group of people down there they can call and they'll come and they'll pick up the snake and they'll take it back into the woods. Um, but it's not a danger unless you're interested in doing something really foolish with a timber rattlesnake. 
Um, and that would be just picking it up with your bare hands. What's that thing? This thing. When we get back to that, young lady. This thing is a rat snake. Rat snake. Yeah. Oops. Let me go back. Does it have other names besides rat snake? Uh, mm, no. Eastern rat snake. Okay. No. Nope. Not to be confused with a black racer? Nope. Black racer is a different snake. Yep. Yeah. So here I want to show you uh, this snake, and then I want everybody to say, okay, what is this? Ribbon snake. I heard somebody who got it right. <laughs> I, I expected a lot of you to say garter snake, and I wanted you to say that because I want you to know that there's another look-alike snake out there that is really quite rare, and we would really like to get more records of, and this is that look-alike snake. It is the ribbon with the bright white lip, beautiful mahogany stripe down there on the bottom, and I'll show you some more pictures. There's a garter which is relatively chunky and when garters puff up with air which this one is doing they don't always do that but when they puff up with air you can see this checkerboard pattern on the sides you can see the white which is either the edge of the scales or the skin below the scales you see the yellow lip with the dark green head over a yellow lip okay up top our ribbon snake, bright white lip, vertical bar, reddish head, a nice black line right here, nice straight black line, so it's a sandwich. Okay, reddish, black, and white. Not so here. It's actually a dark green, kind of an army green, though it shows almost black there. And then see all this irregular yellowish stuff in front of the eye, and what I call the ear spots. Snakes don't have ears, but. Right here, you're seeing this yellow area. That shows up quite clearly on garter snakes. But this is a nice straight line, a thin body, a brown stripe. That white lip is, I think, the easiest field mark to see from a little bit of a distance. There are other differences. One is that this yellow stripe on the side, lateral stripe, is higher up on the side. Here, that yellow stripe is right down next to the belly. And then here, we have this beautiful brown stripe, beautiful uh, dark brown. And then we have a couple scale rows, scales here. And then we have that stripe. But also, see that white? See the white cheeks shining at you? Not here. It also is a skinny snake ribbon with a very, very long tail. And then you think, okay, tail. Where does the tail begin on the snake? Here? You know, here? Well, right here is where the, the vent is, the cloaca is, where reproduction, solid waste, liquid waste, everything takes place. And this is the tail. And, and here, this one is about uh, a quarter to a third the length of the whole snake. Were you to grab the snake by the tail here, it would break off. It's just so thin. It doesn't regrow. It's not like you're going to regrow it, but it's just very, very delicate and very, very slender. Um, so, there's the relative distribution. We have garter snake records from every town in the state, as you would expect. But ribbon snakes? We used to have ribbon snake records from Shelburne, Shelburne Pond. We can't find them there anymore. We had a historic record from out here in South Hero. Um, we had Colchester, a record. We, don't, we can't find any of these snakes. So now, it's really, this is our rich spot in Vermont for reptile diversity, Western Rutland County. And that's the territory that we still find ribbon snakes in, with the exception of the Southern Connecticut River Valley. We have a couple sites down there. But, geez, please do. This is a wetland snake. Feeds on amphibians. Please do keep your eyes open for a snake that uh, looks a lot like a garter snake, but isn't. 
So some things we got to know about snakes and to, to identify snakes. And what, we want, what I want you to know about first is this fold right here, this ridge in the scales. This ridge is called a keel. It sticks up. Were you to rub your thumb across the skin of the snake, it would feel rough. This one has smooth scales, and this feels and looks kind of leathery. And among the roughest are water snakes and timber rattlesnakes. Uh, above the smoothest is this one, which is um, the racer that you mentioned earlier. Very, very smooth scales. Some of our snakes lay eggs. And interestingly enough, in Vermont, the ones that lay eggs have the smooth scales. And the ones that have the keeled scales give live birth. So it's an interesting difference. Now, that won't hold true in other parts of the world. But it does hold true here with one kind of in-betweener, which is the rat snake which has weakly keeled scales, but still lays eggs. Another thing we can look at, I, I, yesterday I got a snake skin in the mail. Um, and so I took a look at it. And one of the things we start, first of all, we start looking, OK, does it have keels? Here's keels. But in this case, this is a shed skin. So the keels are going away from us toward the middle, because when a snake sheds its skin, it's inside out. So this is inside out, and you can, see, see, you can still see the, the keels, but they're going away from us, in toward the middle. So we see the keels. And then the other thing we can do is we can count the number of scale rows mid-body. That's pretty easy. We don't count the belly scales, and we just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you can even turn corners. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, <laughs> And you can count up the total number of scale rows and whether it's keeled or not, and we can look at the vent, and we should be able to figure out what kind of snake we're looking at. That's a rat snake. The one that I got in the mail yesterday was this one, the milk snake. So far, 100% of the records of timber rattlesnake that we get that we follow up on and check out that are outside of the known range of rattlesnakes, 100% of them end up being milk snakes. And the reason is milk snakes rattle. And so somebody sees a snake shaking its tail and goes, oh, geez, must be a rattlesnake. At one place, and, and once somebody makes up their mind like that, it's, it's hard to talk them out of it. You know, I know what it was. I know what it was. It's just like this lady here when she says she sees some rare bird. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you can't talk her out of it. It was a robin. It was a robin. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I've had people on the phone, you know, okay, we've got it. We've got it now. It's here in the trash can. And I ask them questions, and they just try to figure out what's the right question for timber rattlesnake. What's the right answer? You know? I don't even look anymore. So we went to visit one lady. And uh, he said, well, right here in the wall is where they are. So we go start working our way through the wall. And I find a milk snake. Said, is this it? She said, yeah, 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 that's it. I said, well, this is a milk snake. That's not it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Um, but this is a cool thing. Eastern milk snakes, um, it's one of the more frequently reported snakes because it hangs out often near buildings and in old buildings. And this is a perfect shot. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's like an old barn or an old garage. And uh, they are um, Ophiophagus, a term you use a lot. <laughs> 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 Ophio snake, phagus eating. So is it a snake eating snake? <clears throat> it eats other snakes. But it also eats small mammals. So mice, etc. And so it really likes your, your garage. It likes your barn. Um, because it can get all those little small mammals in there. And it frequently shows up in walls of houses if somebody had something show up in their basement or in the wall. Or in one case, it fell out of the ceiling. Oh. They were watching TV. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, they and it laid eggs. In that case, they were laying eggs um, in the chimney. Oh. Ma'am, 
<laughs> Lane hangs in the chimney outside of the, between the flue and the, and the brick, you know, and that. Um, but a nice warm wall in a building, they like it. Great place. And if the mice can get in, they're likely to follow the scent trail of the mice. So if the mice are coming in and out, they may well too. When they're young, they're just beautiful. Beautiful bright colors outlined in black. We have what is generally a white Y on the back of the head. This Y is broken. So it's looking more like three dots. Smooth. So it lays eggs. Kind of a checkerboard pattern on the underside, which might be part of where its slang name came from. Either checkered adder or spotted adder. If you grew up rural, then that's probably the name that you grew up with, spotted adder. But adders are a European snake. They're venomous. This is an American snake. It's not an adder. It's not venomous. You know, so I think our ancestors were just a little loose with their naming. So milk snake is not a particularly great name either. Because the assumption was, well, if they're hanging around the barn, they're probably stealing milk. <laughs> snakes, snakes in general are not in the habit of drinking milk. That's a <laughs> mammal thing. You know, if you can find a snake with breasts on it, <laughs> then maybe I'll believe that they drink milk. But so far, nobody has reported that. Probably will. Oh, wow. So here's one being Ophiophagus. Oh my God. And in this particular case, it threw up, <laughs> and the garter snake was actually a little bit bigger than the milk snake was. A little bit longer. Just an amazing thing that it was taking that down. Um, but when they pull it in, they essentially kink it. They kind of fold it, pleat it, so that it gets zip filed <laughs> into a smaller length, and they can fit it in their stomach. This I think is pretty cool, as we get a good idea of the distribution of the snakes. So right here, we're seeing that this egg-laying snake is missing from the northeast corner of the snake in a few higher elevation towns, as far as we can tell so far, um, of the state. Because it would be that much colder and would have, I mean, if you're an egg layer, you're not well adapted to the north. You are laying your eggs somewhere and you're hoping that the temperature, the outside temperature, is going to incubate your eggs. You just lay them and leave them. And so if you think about how well the Vermont summers incubate eggs, you know, sometimes they would work. And they'll probably work better in the future with climate change for some of these species. But it's better to be a live bearing snake because if your young are inside your body as they develop and the sun leaves the place where you are, you just move into the sun. And you keep following the sun around, and you can keep warming yourself up and keep the kids warm. But if you just leave your eggs somewhere, that's a tougher, that's a, a tougher way to survive this far north. So the real survivors like garter snakes that are, that are at higher elevations and, and northern latitudes give live birth. So take a look at that for a second until you figure out what's going on. Here's, here's the distribution of the snakes. And this is hardiness zones. And so this particular hardiness zone, 4B to 5B here, and that's where it ends. And look how closely the distribution of the milk snake follows that temperature. You know, I think that's really pretty amazing. Even this little bit here and that little bit there. And so it does strongly suggest to me that as the climate warms, milk snakes will probably move up in elevation and, and further north. Now here is a live birth snake and one tough little live birth snake too. 
high, right up on the long trail up in the northeast kingdom, the red-bellied snake. And you can't really see its red belly right there. You can faintly see that it has a light spot on its neck and one on either side. And those are good field marks. The body color varies quite a bit from light brown through gray to solid black. But the belly, red-bellied snake, you know, pick it up, Lynn, pick it up. <laughs> and look at it, it's 12 inches long. What can it possibly do to you? <laughs> it's our smallest snake, beautiful little thing. Um, really more widespread in woodland openings, not so much the Champlain Basin, but uh, if your house is surrounded by woods, um, then that's a decent piece of habitat for it. There's some variation in the color. One of the darker ones, one of the lighter ones. Its distribution. Now you see in some towns there that we con we consider assumed. Let's see if I can get that. You know this gray. We're assuming that this snake is in all these other towns. This means we haven't had a record for 25 years, but it's probably just because we haven't had somebody up there giving us a record in the last 25 years. I suspect they're still there. There's no real sign of decline in this particular species, but please do go for a hike in any one of these towns and start turning over some logs and some bark and stuff and see if you can find yourself a red-bellied snake. You'd be filling in our maps and that would be very much appreciated. This guy looks pretty similar, and he's small. And you wonder if that whole bird thing about giving up people's names in the names of birds, have you heard about that? Yeah. They're trying to get rid of, to stop the use of personal names, family names. So a big nail thrush will become, what's it going to become, Ron, you know? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if that would happen with uh, other critters as well, but this is named after an old uh, naturalist, Decay, uh, Decay's brown snake. This is really a Champlain Basin snake. Uh, around the edges of big, wet fields, or, uh, Dead Creek marshes, um, places, the, the big marshes at the north end of Lake Bombazine, that kind of stuff. They like the wet margins, and then in the fall, they move up into the rocky hillsides and get down deep so that they don't freeze. So uh, a Champlain Basin snake, and I think uh, I'll have a, a map for you in a second. It's got some pretty delicate field marks. See this black on top of the head? That's useful. Below the eye? Uh, sideburns, maybe? Uh, sideburns and then this piece here. All those black markings on the head are useful, and the, and the fact is that, well, you think maybe it's a red belly snake, but then you pick it up, no, no red belly. Very similar otherwise, though. What's cool is that the little babies uh, have this ring around the neck, but notice they still have the black on top of the head, they still have the black sideburns, the black here and the black under the eye. Even though they look like they have a complete white ring, it is broken in a number of places. That particular snake, Mama was run over near our house in Salisbury, and the kids were just squeezed out of her body like toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube. And so I grabbed the kids and moved them out of the road and brought this guy home for some pictures first. Um, but I mean, look at this, this is a quarter here, so this thing is three inches, you know, no bigger than a worm. And so oftentimes we see snakes that are that small, and other people would just pass them over and think, ah, worm maybe, or, or probably more likely just not seen at all. So brown snake, Champlain Basin, lowlands, primarily. There's a place where um, I used to take my daughters out by um, Snake Mountain that where uh, after you get maybe the first or second frost in the fall 
and then you get a warm sunny day, temperature getting back up above freezing, 40 or 50 maybe even in the sun, and all the snakes would come out of the fields and head up on Snake Mountain on the slope to spend winter. And we would walk a couple hundred yard section and count maybe a hundred of these little snakes coming across. Um, occasionally a red belly, occasionally some other snakes mixed in too, garters and others. But these snake crossing sites in the fall are really fun to go out and see what's moving. This is a beautiful snake. Ring neck snake, yellow on the underside, yellow or orange ring around the neck, but outlined in black, clearly outlined, smooth scales, so it lays eggs. Um, the big defense, in some people's minds, of our snakes is not its ability to bite, because this snake, tiny mouth, could barely break your skin, if at all, even if it tried. And if you handle it right, it's not going to try. But what will it do? It can poop on you. <laughs> and it's not just poop. Uh, this poop coming out here is like bird poop. It's a mixture of solid waste, liquid waste, and then something cool mixed in, cool for them, musk. And if you've smelled that on your hands before after handling a snake, it can be pretty strong and not pleasant. And some big snakes, it can be voluminous. <laughs> a lot of stuff that they pump out, particularly something like a water snake. Um, and this one, as pretty as it is, has some pretty stinky musk. Though it cleans off, I mean, you can wash your hands and get rid of it. So, pretty wide distribution of the ring neck snake. Um, I generally find it associated with some pretty good cover, rock or down trees, and so there's areas of agriculture in the Champlain Valley where we haven't been able to find that kind of cover and we can't find the snakes. But um, in particular, when you get down in Western Rutland County in the Slate Territory, lots of rock, lots of things to hide under, and uh, lots of ringneck snakes. There's a beauty. Um, smooth green snake. Uh, it likes open, grassy, or early successional or sedgy areas, which is its challenge. Because if those are sedgy or grassy because you get out there and mow them regularly, then that's a tough place for them to make a living because they get killed by the mowers. On the other hand, if you hay it, you hay it, and you get big equipment on there, and then you come back with the equipment and you put it in rows, and then they hide under the rows, and then you come back and bail it. You know, that's a tough life too. So where do you find these things? Well, imagine places like sedges, sedge meadows, wet meadows that nobody wants to farm, they're too wet. That would be a place that they could be. And as ugly as they are, power lines. Power lines are because they get lots of sun, it's lots of green, they're insect eaters. And so power lines they'll use. Light pastures, sheep, horses, where it's the animals that keep those pastures open. Um, so you can find them there. Or maybe you have an area you like to keep open, but you do it with a brush hog once a year. Not a big threat. You know, they could survive there, and uh, you keep it open, you get your view, but you don't hay it, and you don't take heavy equipment over it regularly. Um, so there's a couple places, I mean, uh, some odd sort of situations. Uh, Goshen Dam, on the dam itself. You know, the dam is kept open. It's steep, though. They can't really mow it regularly. Uh, we can find them on the dam there occasionally, which is kind of fun. Interestingly enough, some of the pigments which make the colors of snakes disappear or break down when the snake dies. So if somebody comes to me with a report of a dark blue, solid blue snake on the road, it was a smooth green snake that is now a flat blue snake. 
And you can see that the yellow pigment has broken down around the edges of these scales. And so they're turning blue, and with time, the whole scales have turned blue. Because green and yellow, I'm sorry, blue and yellow are making the green. And when you lose that yellow pigment, the blue shows up. Here's a nice adult. It's not a big snake, 16 inches maybe. And an egg layer. There's a little bugger coming out of the egg. These eggs, by the way, are, are not calciferous. They're not hard. They're, I don't find, I very rarely am I lucky enough to find the snake eggs. Uh, once in a great while I do. And they have a texture that's more like a young puffball or a young mushroom kind of. You, you can poke it and it's kind of leathery, but it's not hard. And that would be maybe one thing. This is some kind of weird fungus that you might think at first. Here's a piece of edge habitat that would be good for them. And one thing I didn't mention before is they like to have some rock mixed in. So we have some rock and we have the grassy stuff. Um, a lot of that early successional stuff that was abandoned farmland in the Champlain Valley has grown up now. So that's not good habitat for them anymore. Interestingly enough, like some of the other egg layers, missing from Northeast Kingdom. Doing survey work sometimes, I'll try to find the local diner and get in there about 6.30 in the morning when then there's that local clump of people that are sitting in there having coffee together every morning and say, okay, what do you guys have around here for snakes? <laughs> and it's interesting because green snakes, eh, we ain't got any of them. Uh, spotted adders? No, I ain't got no spotted adders. Never heard of them. Here we're getting to a bigger snake. Common water snake. Chunky, big heavy body. Uh, size and shape like a timber rattlesnake. Heavily keeled. Um, he heavily abandoned. I don't call these blotches. I call these more like saddles because they come all the way over to the side. And it's got these nice saddles when it's young. Yeah, as it gets older, it gets a little darker. And here's a nice big one. And the pattern can be very, very difficult to see, except on the belly there's usually still some color. Um, I, I remember one time uh, we were with the family over Mineville. Was it mine though? It was over in New York State anyhow. And, uh, and there was a water snake on, on the edge of the parking lot. And the girls wanted me to catch it. And I said, all right, all right, I'll catch it. And first of all, water snakes are nervous. Yeah. And so they're not a starter snake. Yeah. They're not the one I'm going to introduce Lynn to uh, <laughs> first. I'll find a more docile snake. And so unless you handle them right, they're going to bite. And it might bite a few times. And it's no really big deal because the teeth are maybe two millimeters. I mean, the thorns on roses are bigger, and, and uh, um, they're plants, you know, that you put in your yard on purpose uh, <laughs> that do more damage to you than these things. But they can break your skin, and so you may bleed a little bit. And so I was bleeding, and I wiped my hands on my white pants. And so then I was white and red. <laughs> and then it dumped its musk on my leg. And I had a bunch of that. So then I, this is pretty smart of me, I grabbed a bunch of grass and I rubbed it off the grass. And then I was green, white, black, and red. And we haven't even gone into the museum yet. <laughs> cool thing, water snakes. See how colorful they are on the other side? Really pretty. These half moons are pointing toward the tail. Always do. These half moons. Champlain Basin snake. Only one place down here, Vernon, in an old fish hatchery in Vernon, can we find them. Otherwise, on our side of the lake. And there's some 
places that are kind of famous. Shelburne Pond, uh, it's got a good population of them. East Creek, a good population of them. So near water bodies, particularly where there's rock that comes into Bristol Pond. Yeah. Rock and water together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, here Has a real rattle. It's not just shaking its tail. It's holding a segmented rattle up in the air. No. This is one you don't pick up. <laughs> it's not that they're uh, aggressive or any of that, but if you pick it up, well, there's the, there's the rattlesnake cults in West Virginia, and the idea is if you have faith, you can handle the snake, and it's not going to bite you. And that's true with most snakes. If you handle it gently, and you're not scared, and you just let it move around your hands, it's not going to bite you. Now, interestingly enough, the leader of that church kind of screwed up. He's dead. But his son has taken over. And so the religion continues. Uh, and maybe you should attend the service there. You can see and get a chance to handle a timber rattlesnake. Though I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, even timber there. Yeah, yeah. Timber rattlesnakes generally are described by the color of the head. A uh, yellow face with this yellowish head, or black face with a much darker head. The yellowish ones also have a lighter colored body, and the pattern shows up better. The dark ones, a uh, much darker uh, body, and sometimes they look almost completely black. Notice this particular, this particular, um, rattle has broken off which is not unusual that they break off as they age and we can tell it's broken off because it's not tapering this is kind of even sided and then just ends but if you were to count the number of complete rattles and divide it by 1.4 you'll get a rough idea of the age of the snake <laughs> a rough idea of the age of the snake each time the snake sheds it leaves some hard, dry skin on the rattle, and that makes up a segment. So each time the snake sheds, it adds another segment. Keratin, like fingernail material. I, um, you get a reaction when you hear that rattle. Uh, I remember one time we were looking for, for rattlesnakes uh, in Western Rutland County. We had a game warden with us. We had a, another biologist with us, and I heard the rattle, and I, you know, I yelled, hey, and the game warden disappeared up the hill. <laughs> he was gone. And the biologist and I saw the snake move downhill. It was interesting because this is the one snake we have that takes care of its young. None of the others do. They just have the young leave, or they lay the eggs and leave. This one takes care of the young for about a few weeks or so. Then they're on their own. And so when it's moving, the kids were moving with it. Oh my God. And the kids were always in contact with the body of the snake. So they were moving, they're all moving together almost like one organism, but crawling over the backs. Uh, it was a very, very cool thing. And, and so my buddy and I were running after it. The other guy disappeared uphill, like I said. And, and then we saw it go under a rock, and then we're kind of looking under the rock, and took some pictures of it. The snake was kind of looking back out at us with kind of this, okay, what now? Are you going to do something stupid here, or are we going to de-escalate? <laughs> and, and we de-escalated, but some snakes actually make what appears to be eye contact with, with you. And they're usually the predaceous snakes, because the way their eyes are arranged, they're looking forward. And so it's kind of, all right, what are you going to do, you know? And, and you see that in some snakes where other snakes, like a garter snake, I don't know, almost looks like they're blind. I mean, they're certainly not making eye contact. They have a new nasty disease that has come into the, this area. 
and, and it eats away at your skin, and in some cases, this is a face over here in the lower right. You know, it's, it's nasty, and it's had a big effect on the populations of New Hampshire. Not so much here, though, we have seen it. And, and we have seen it in some other snakes, too. So this is one of those new fungal diseases, diseases that has spread into the area uh, that we are concerned about. What, what snake? We've seen it affect um, milk snakes. Well, I've seen some impacts on uh, rat snakes. Um, I've not seen it ever on a garter, a red belly. So there are other snakes, but we've only seen it on a few here. Um, so timber rattlesnake. Historically, you can see all these things are getting diagonal stripes on it. Springfield was a site. Down here, uh, there was a mountain over here called Wintastic Hit in New Hampshire, and so there were snakes that were showing up because they wandered from the dens a few miles, you know, four or five miles. And so these snakes are probably coming from New Hampshire dens. This was a Vermont den. Uh, and so really what we have left is this population right here in Western Mountain County. Um, and a few different den sites, but um, it's a snake that we're quite concerned about. It looked like it was in Bristol there. Oh, yeah. It is. On the Bristol Cliffs, yeah. Yeah. historically. Yeah. yeah, and there used to be snake drives there. It was not unusual because the snakes would come from miles around to one den, and once you figured out where the den was, mm -hmm. if you didn't like the snakes, you'd go to the den. They used to have shooting parties. Oh, yeah. my God. You know, they all yeah. get up. And, and the pictures are weird because the, they were hunting in clothes that we wouldn't hunt in now. They're pretty well dressed up. It's like a Sunday afternoon oh outing or something. Oh and around shooting them. And of course rat snakes are coming out of the same den, so rat snakes got oh. shot as well. Oh, but we don't have any recent records yeah. from Bristol anymore, but historically... Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, the rat snake. It, you know, most of us growing up in, in rural Vermont, <coughs> um, we're used to, when we thought of snakes, we thought of something like it was a foot or too long. Big would be over two feet. But now we're switching to a snake that uh, it could be easily five feet, wow. and some are over six feet. Um, and they love hollow trees. And what we've come up with, the closest thing to hollow trees, is old buildings. So they were in the hollow trees looking for bird eggs. Sorry, birds. <laughs> bird eggs, fledglings, that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, Rats, mice, baby squirrels, that kind of stuff. But um, one of the first things we do when we're looking to see if rat snakes are in an area is go to find some old barn or old garage and then look for shed skins. Because if they're around, it's a lot easier to find the old shed skins in one of those buildings than it is to actually find the snake. Um, as, they're, uh, as they stretch out, you can start seeing the white on the skin between the scales. And it's pretty typical for a rat snake to see this kind of speckled white stuff on the sides rather than solid black. And the underside here, this is toward the tail, is kind of a mottled black, but white up here, checkerboard pattern in the middle, uh, shaped kind of like a loaf of bread, not rounded, but with a rounded back and kind of vertical sides and then a flat bottom. And when they're young, they get a lot of people fooled because they look maybe like a milk snake. But if you look at the corners of these blotches, the blotches are not rounded. They have corners. They look like little flying squirrels <laughs> or little H's. Huh. And um, not always reddish like this, sometimes gray background like that. But these are young rat snakes. And these are just such excellent climbers. They're just so cool when, we, when we're out on a field trip and we find a rat snake. I can't resist but to catch it and put it on a tree. <laughs> and if the tree's rough, they can climb the tree. It's not a question of branches. They are just hooking their belly scales on a little rough spot. And then they climb their way up. This one climbed it up and then found this hole in the tree. He said, hmm, I'm going in. 
it went in and it, went, it was hollow and it went up the tree and it came out further up oh, wow. in another woodpecker hole. <laughs> so we have only two populations of this snake that we are aware of. The northern one, which is pretty much centered on uh, like the watershed center in Bristol, that area. And then the southern one here, uh, western Rutland County. This one now, of course, isolated. No genetic connection here anymore. And we have some concern about that, and my concern really about that population is that with the recreation in the area, it, it's bike trails. I don't so, so much mind people hiking there, but with a bike, if somebody's cruising along on a bike and sees what looks like a stick on the trail, uh, even if they recognize it as a snake, I don't think they could stop fast enough to do that. So. The hikers seem to be coexisting up there with it pretty well, and we get reports from the hikers, but mm. I, I have concerns about wheeled vehicles mm. in that very, very limited area. Moncton just purchased a piece up there, which is becoming the Moncton Town Forest, and some people want to have a lot of recreational bike trails up there, and I would prefer that not happen. Mm. Craig mentioned this snake earlier. Similar, all black, but well, this is a racer. Look at the head. Now, I think Darth Vader here. Yeah. <laughs> we have eyebrows. Um, and it's smooth scaled. It's solid black. It doesn't have any speckles on it. It's fast and it's nervous. And once again, it's not a starter snake. It hunts during the day. That's what herpetologists look like, by the way. <laughs> this is one of the last populations we were aware of we haven't found since 2014. Oh, wow. Haven't found a racer in Vermont. Oh. Little racers, great big eyes. Isn't that cute? Isn't that cute? Solid color tail. This was their historic range. And you can see a lot of these diagonal lines and we can't find them there anymore. And the last population we know of was right down here. And we worked hard to conserve that population. We, we cut down, a, luckily, part of that land was owned by the state. It cut down a lot of trees. We created some meadows because this is another open country snake. And it was surviving in power lines and along the border of the interstate. <laughs> Dangerous place to be a snake and try to stay in grassy habitat. Actually, uh, I should uh, <laughs> I should mention some, something else here. I should mention something else. Let's see. The last, there was a villain when we were studying that population. Let's say we had maybe eight snakes total left in that population that we were watching. And um, one of them, uh, we had two that were carrying transmitters. One of them that was carrying a transmitter got run over. It didn't get run over in the interstate, it got run over on a logging road by a pickup truck. Okay, the other one, we lost it, and then we, I was driving up and down the interstate with an antenna out the window trying to figure out where the signal would come from. And we got a signal in Massachusetts, which actually is not all that far, because we were in Vernon to begin with, but we were a few miles away and we hiked up in there and we found the transmitter but nothing else. Something had eaten our snake. Oh. Personally, I believe the villain, prepare yourself, was a red-tailed hawk. So now, when you see a red tail, shoot it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying saying shoot red tails. We saw that darn red tail carrying snakes off. Oh, and I think one red tail that figured out how to catch these snakes in that power line over a period of time could have eliminated the population. Do I know that that red tail is guilty? No. <laughs> but I'm suspicious. <laughs> Surgically implanted. So you do a cut. We had a, a vet down there um, that would do it for us and do a cut in the side about three quarters down the body, and transmitter was about the size of a cigarette butt. And then there was an antenna that was threaded under the skin, which is perfect for a snake. 
because oh, sure, it, you, you know, it just went all under the skin on part of the body, mm -hmm. a little wire. <laughs> so this is a, uh, we have a few records of this snake from Vermont. We don't yet call it one of our native species, but we have a couple records of, of juveniles, and they like sandy soil. We don't have a lot of sandy soil, but there's a little bit in Vernon, and we got a couple young snake reports from Vernon, and there's a little bit up in the Colchester Burlington area, and we got a report of a baby snake up there too. Could somebody be releasing baby hognose snakes? Could be, but I doubt it. But easy to recognize. Look at this nose. That rostral scale, that flat thing for burrowing into the soil. That's why they like sandy soil, because they like to hide in the soil. Um, so a cool, some cool snake facts. Cranial kinesis. Now, isn't that a nice term? Wouldn't you like to put that in your bumper sticker? <laughs> The one that I have, we do, we made a bumper sticker, I didn't bring any, that says, support mandibular liberation. And with a fist on it, can you see that? Support mandibular liberation. Okay, what's that mean? Uh, that means that you're just not connecting the mandibles in the front. Our mandible has bone hair, you know, so we can't do much with it. But if you don't connect the mandibles in the front, then these things can do great things. If you want a big meal, they can reach out this way, they can reach up that way, mandibles can move, you can hook into your food, pull it in, hook into your food, that's mandibular liberation. And cranial kinesis, that's the top part. They can move the top part of their jaw separately from their skull. Cranial kinesis, so they can be moving stuff around and pulling it in. And they don't have any arms or legs, as you know, I hope. Um, so this is what they're using, this is what they're moving to pull that food into their body. Here's a little rabbit. Rabbit. Wow. Little rabbit. Wow. Baby rabbit. Going down the throat of a rat snake. Okay. Here's, here's one that had a nice big meal, garter snake. Look at the pattern here. And then here, something big is in there, and it's stretching the skin, so you see that pattern, the checkerboard pattern, and you see the white skin between the scales. Here's something cool. They have, on this bone, teeth right here. That Not only do they have teeth on the jaw, tiny little teeth, a couple millimeters, but also on another bone right here, they have two rows of teeth on the top side to keep the prey from getting out. And the extendable glottis. So if you have something in your mouth like this frog, that's the snake's eyes there and the snake's upper lip. This is the frog. Frog's legs. Snakes don't have legs. Remember that. Yeah. And here is, ex is its extendable glottis so they don't suffocate. It's sticking that tube out to breathe through while it has a mouthful. Which could be kind of handy, you know, when you're choking at the table because you sucked in your whatever it was. <laughs> and that would be nice to stick that tube out and get a nice breath of air. All right. There's some kinky sex that goes on. That's kind of cool. We're talking snake sex now. This is snake sex. Wall hanging in the air. And these are hemipenes. Snakes have two hemipenes. They are tucked in, inside out, just like my pockets. And then when it's time to breathe, essentially you imagine reaching into the end of your pocket and pulling it out, inside out. So it comes out, inside out. And so these little barbs that you see here, when this was tucked in, at the base of their tail, those barbs were going inside. And then when it comes out, the barbs are on the outside. That's so you can have this kind of kinky sex and not separate because female might be trying to get away from you and you have two of them but you don't use both of them at the same time. I got this call from a lady in Waterbury one day. She said, there's a dead snake on the road and it's the weirdest thing. It has these two little pink legs. I said, ma'am, 
ma'am. Those are not little pink legs. Those are little pink heavy beans. Pink heavy beans. Barbed on the end. So that's all of our snakes in our one lizard. And I just want to just take a quick look at this, just so you kind of get an idea of, oops, so you kind of get an idea of relative abundance, number of towns that we have records from, garter snake, definitely way up there on top, you know, 225 towns, working our way down to hognose, which we're not really even sure is native here, but we have records from two towns, rattlesnake five, Working way up. So milk snake, ring neck snake, rib belly snake, those are the snakes that people see the most here in Vermont. Sizes, rat snake, you know, the average length of the top 10% of adults, uh, 71.5, which is almost six feet long. And the largest one that I have actually measured, 6'3, down in Benson, working our way down to our littlest snakes. The red belly snake down here. If you want to measure yourself a snake and you think it's unusually big, you might get the record snake. <laughs> and you'll be the envy of at least 10 people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I gotta go conservation just a little bit here at the end because yeah. really the big threats to, to not only snakes, but to all our wildlife is us as humans. And largely, it's the rate at which we consume land. This is Essex, which is now uh, Essex Junction, the city of Essex Junction. In 2022, became a city as opposed to the town. Now, sure, there's snakes that could be living out here. But in here, this would be a tough place to survive as a snake, you know, with roads and lawnmowers and pets. So in general, we consume land or develop it at about the rate of 75 square miles per decade. Now we only have so much room, and if we believe that we can continually develop 75 square miles every 10 years, we're just going to have less and less wildlife habitat. We're going to have fewer and fewer healthy ecosystems. We're going to have more and more flooding. We don't have that kind of flood control. And um, we have to kind of come to the realization, as some people have, that we have to figure out how to have a healthy economy without continually consuming more and more land. Mm -hmm. And it's possible. It is possible. So if we look at population, just population, uh, in Vermont, and watch how that's changed over the years, and we still are, what, the second, Smaller. in terms of, of uh, density of humans, I think we're like, we're the second lowest, with maybe Wyoming being the lowest. But still, if we're consuming land at a regular rate and we're a small little state, we're just losing habitat, we're losing forest land, we're losing farmland at a regular rate. So I throw out this particular equation which is not far from the one that my teacher showed me back in environmental science. <laughs> and um, what we're looking at, okay, it's not just population. It's the amount, the amount of resources used per person. A big population in rural India or Tanzania is having a lot less impact on the natural environment than uh, five super wealthy people, you know, because they're consuming so many resources. So population times resource use per capita, and then we have kind of an efficiency factor, which is, okay, we're driving, uh, we're getting better mileage, and we're recycling, we're using less plastic. So this is, we try to address most of our issues with technology, but we have not tried to address these other two human population growth and the amount of resources that we're using per capita. And you can, and there are, and there have been for years, ecological economists out there saying, hey, we have to build these ecological impacts into our economic models, and we have to 
figure out how to address um, the damage that we're doing. And there's some great, we have a, a reading list on our website here, on our Vermont Herp Atlas website. But uh, John Erickson at UVM, the Gun Institute, got a great book out. Or you can get him to speak. Maybe a good speaker. Uh, John. Uh, Tim Jackson, great, great book. It, environmental, ecological economists have been around for a long time, but they've never been mainstream. But they're saying the traditional economics is not looking at taking the future sustainability of the planet into consideration. Amen. So, Mr. Salamander tells us, we have claimed, our species has claimed all the land and if in all the oceans, and if other species are going to survive, we got to take their needs into consideration and be a good landlord. Please report your sightings. We love to hear what you're seeing. It's very, very helpful. Take a picture, send it to us. I stuck a couple things up here on the table. There's a couple snake skins. If you want to take a look at them, we got a timber rattlesnake and rat snake skin. Um, got a couple amphibian guides here and a few hats. Um, so if you're interested in looking at any of this, please do. But now it's question time if there's questions. And, uh, Jim, do uh, snakes, like all of one type, have the same number of vertebrae? Oh, if they're the same species? Yeah. That's a good question. I want to pretend like I know the answer. Okay. <laughs> and say probably. Yeah. Say probably the snake. Yeah, probably, maybe. maybe. Okay. Um, <laughs> I bet within the same species, if there's, I bet it is the same number of vertebrae. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But I don't know that for sure. Yes, ma'am. Are there any benefits to us from a timber rattlesnake? Not, not that I'm saying they have to have benefit to us, but just that might make people feel more kindly towards us? Okay, first let me digress for a second. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. Because, you know, whenever somebody says, well, you know, what is the benefit to us? I said, well, it's like asking, what's the benefit of your brother to you? <laughs> your brother may be of absolutely no benefit to you at all, but that doesn't mean... We don't care for our brother, and we don't try to keep our brother alive, or our neighbor. What benefit is that old guy in the trailer, you know, next to you, to you? Or what benefit is the guy in Guatemala, or the woman in Haiti, to you? Doesn't matter to us whether they live or die. In terms of benefit, I personally think we have a moral, ethical obligation to all these other creatures we are just one of them, and to keep them all on this planet. So, what benefit does a timber rattlesnake have to you on your property? Well, it would help keep some of the small mammal population down. It might keep the rabbit population down if you're a gardener. If you tell people, it might keep people away. Keep other people away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to get these records from this place up by Montpelier, and, and uh, and it was, it was all a farce. They were trying to keep development. This one guy was trying to keep development from around his favorite lake. And so he was posting on, uh, on uh, kiosks and stuff. Watch out for the rattlesnakes. rattlesnakes. There were no rattlesnakes here, but it was a kind of a good approach. Um, so, you know, I think the truth of the matter is, you know, there's the, there's the airplane analogy. You're flying in the airplane and you see a rivet pop off the wing. Well, it's one rivet and the plane's still flying. Another rivet pops off the wing. Still going. Four or five pop and part of the sheet metal comes off. You know, and so I think you can you can you can miss some rivets. We have now already uh, a boreal course frog probably disappeared in 1999. 
Probably very few people know about that. It had disappeared from Vermont. We haven't been able to find it. What was the frog? B-O-R, Northern, B-O-R-E-A-L, chorus frog. It was just in the northwestern corner of the state, Franklin and, and uh, Grand Isle counties. And so is there any ecological disaster taking place up there? <laughs> Nobody's even noticed. But do I feel badly about it? I do. You know, something happened. What happened? Was it agricultural chemicals changed mm -hmm. up there because this was a low agricultural land sort of creature? Was it uh, a weather pattern change, a drought that wiped them out? A climate change sort of thing? Mm -hmm. We don't know, but it's gone. Most people don't even know about it. Racer may be gone now. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes a difference to me, but you know, frankly, the impact on me is on my life, probably pretty much zero, but I do care, and I think we all should care. Yeah? Jim, I've always wondered how. Oh, I should say, another teacher, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you actually admit that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how does the snake actually move so quickly? Is it the wiggling thrust, or does the scales on the bottom of the snake? It's not. It it, it's not really the bottom of the snake. That, it, it, I mean, a snake rectilinear motion would be trying to move straight ahead, which is very, very difficult and very, very slow. If a snake just moved like that, and they would have to do that with the scales uh, that way, but they don't move like that. They move like this, and what they're really doing is when. When they form that angle here, they're pushing backwards. And if you watch the rest of the snake, it follows in exactly the same mm. trail. So the tail comes right by the end. They're, they're pushing on that, whatever that is, where that corner is. Mm. And then the snake comes back around like this, and they're pushing back from the back side of that loop. So each back side of that loop mm. is pushing backwards against the ground or the sticks or whatever it is. And so they're using that, and it becomes really clear when you see them climbing the tree, because you see that they get a, a little nub on the tree, and the body goes that way with their head, and the whole rest of their body will follow exactly that same route and push back on that same nub. And then they'll get a series of nubs. <clears throat> Up here will be the next nub, the next nub. So how they do this, push it all these right five or six different good places is an amazing thing, but it's not really the scales, it's the side of their body that's pushing. I don't know if that, that make any sense? Good. The muscles, yeah. This is a snake lady, by the way. That's how we used to know her. She was a snake. She traveled around with snakes to different schools. Yeah. A few months ago, um, I found a shedded snake skin in yeah. of my house, and it was a few feet away from a grand piano. Yeah. Is it possible that a snake could crawl up the leg of a piano and hide in there somewhere? Yeah. We have a particular type of snake that really likes to play the piano. And I <laughs> I'm sure. Do you hear music at night? <laughs> um, most snakes couldn't do that leg. The rat snake, which is a really nice long snake, if there was something rough uh, either on the leg of the piano that it could get a grip on, which it probably isn't. Yeah. Um, it was a fairly short skin. It wasn't that long. No, I don't think it was in your piano. No? Oh, good. I think came out of one of, <laughs> I think it came out of one of your walls or your cellar. No. Or maybe through under a door. I don't know. For a cat? You got a cat? Yes. Well, there you go. I mean, right. cats bring in stuff. And they deposit it for you. <laughs> yeah, we had a yeah. snake in our entrance hallway, which we escorted out, and then, yeah. which I thought was a fluke. And then about five days later, uh, I think it was the same snake showed up in the bathroom right off the entrance hallway. Mm. So I went over to Agway and got some snake repellent. Mm. And I was surprised to find out there's about four or five different brands of repellent. That I yeah, guess frankly, I don't know if any of them work. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well. Your cat sounds suspicious to me. <laughs> but if you have other mice in your house? Occasionally. 
So if you got a hole big enough for a mouse to come in, yeah. then you got a hole big enough for a snake to come in. And Unless you go around the outside of your house and plug all those holes with expanding foam or something like that. So. The um, rattlesnake, how does it care for the, the baby for two weeks? Well, essentially all it does is protect them because it's not, it's not feeding them. Mm -hmm. So it's just protecting them from other not predators. Not giving them any milk. Huh? No milk there. <laughs> <laughs> you fight a breast on a snake, I'll give you a movie prize. Movie prize. <laughs> <laughs> that was an accident. But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think it's just uh, probably just keeping away the predators, the other predators. Because little snakes could be eaten by a lot of things. Yeah. How often would a black rat snake feed on, say, a mouse? Oh, well, because they are ectothermic, solar heated, uh, an ectothermic creature of the same mass as an endothermic creature is something like 3% of the, it needs about 3% of the, the same energy intake as the mammal would. So, not eating a lot of stuff and being much more efficient with what it does eat. Um, if we were solar powered, it would be a lot better for the planet. <laughs> we would eat a lot less food. Um, so, you could eat a big meal, uh, chipmunk, let's say, and be set for a week, you know, set for a while. Or you could be eating, uh, well, one thing rat snakes like eggs, if you live within the rat snake range and you have a chicken coop, yeah. great place to look for them. We had one, and when they get nervous like us, you know, they can throw up, throw up seven chicken eggs <laughs> in different stages of digestion. But um, I think those seven chicken eggs, that guy was really like me at a Chinese buffet. <laughs> eat more than he really needed. And my guess would be they'd be, be doing fine for a week or more. You know? and, and remember, too, that they're going all winter with no food. They're doing seven months with no food. But they're also chilled down. So their whole metabolic rate is much slower. I'm curious to know if all states have such a comprehensive reptilian atlas of Vermont, and is it something that, um, if the second question to that is, who funds that? Is it the state? Is it a federal <laughs> level? Is it... <laughs> <laughs> my, wife, my wife makes baskets. <laughs> Gary and his wife make donations. <laughs> uh, um, so first off, no, um, all states do not have uh, such comprehensive atlases and generally speaking what they might do is get a grant that's a short term grant and and get out there a lot during a period of two or three years as long as the grant lasts get as much data as they can and then then they don't get anything again for a period of time a number of states have kind of informal atlases where there's at least a place a portal where you can report what you see but there may not be a person at the other end of it very often the state of Vermont itself, I'm not the state, my database is pretty well cut up. I transfer the rare species records to them. They're about two years behind in entering that data. Mm -hmm. But that's just because Fish and Wildlife, they have a, a hugely, a much larger responsibility than they initially evolved to have. It was hunting and fishing. Mm. And then once you start taking in all the rest of the species, you know, they don't have the people, they work hard, mm. but they don't have the people to really keep up with all that stuff. Mm. So, fortunately for you, you have me. <laughs> <laughs> the Vermont Reptile Amphibian Atlas, we've been going since 1994. Uh, I chair a group called the Reptile Amphibian Scientific Advisory Group to the Vermont Endangered Species Committee. Mm. And uh, we needed more data to make conservation recommendations to the Endangered Species Committee. So we decided back in 1994, we've got to start gathering data. First we just got data from each other, and then we decided to create a portal, and then we just have continued, I have continued,
what I have continued with fundraiser, fundraiser information, annual fundraisers, grants, uh, fish and wildlife, uh, forest ecosystem monitoring cooperative, the Lintel Hack Foundation, and the South Lake Champlain Trust. Hmm. Primarily those things keep me going. Um, but we are in the middle of a fundraiser right now. <laughs> um, Is there a hat at the door? Tell us some of the prizes. Oh, yeah. Some of the prizes? Yes. Yeah. Well, well, you can, <laughs> you, can, you can get one of my bumper stickers, Mandibular Liberation. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you can give a little bit more money, and um, you can get yourself in a category where we have a drawing for a, a, a Herc field trip. You and ten of your friends, uh -huh. and so if you get into that category, and we do the drawing next month, we've done that every year. Take out somebody and ten of their friends. If you give a thousand or more, <laughs> I'm pretending. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Kathy told me about it. <laughs> you need a thousand more, you get a field trip anyhow. We just take you out on a field trip. If you're a funder. We'll take you out on a field trip. Um, so, uh, yeah, we do have we do have prizes, but it, um, how this is handled varies a lot from state to state. A lot. Yeah. What about uh, the trend line from your uh, 30 years of data? Yeah. What do you see? Uh, I mean, you mentioned the uh, Northeast Kingdom having an extinction event <clears throat> that you don't know how it started, how it went, what went down. Are there are we on the brink of any other extinction events? Well, I think the racer I'm real concerned about down in the other corner of the state, the yeah. southeast corner of the state, um, mm -hmm. racer, um, fish and wildlife, wildlife working really hard to uh, do their best to support a timber rattlesnake population, um, trying to conserve pieces of land, um, trying to create underpasses under sections of Route 22A so they don't get run over on the road. Yeah. Yeah. That's something you might hear about in the future. It's a group I'm working with. Yeah. Um, other species that are particularly rare that we're concerned about, spiny softshell turtle was one of them. And there was a real concern about um, the new bridge going from Swanton to Alberg because it went through the area where most of them spent the winter. Oh gosh! And but but we worked with the contractors, and I think we minimized impact there. And spiny stuff shows are still hanging in, but it's a small population. Um, let's see what's most likely to disappear. I think. Is the black rat snake still on the danger? I know it was. It's it's a. Uh, is a threatened species, and uh, I think it's holding its own. Um, I'm concerned about that northern population. It's isolated, genetically isolated, and, and there's a there's big recreational pressure there, but it seems to be doing okay. We've got quite a few records this year. Um, long term, just long term, I. I am concerned about the impacts of global warming mm. on a variety of our reptiles and amphibians. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and I got some attention in the local paper and the local news not long ago, was that back in, like just r right after Christmas, the ground was still thawed out. We didn't have any snow cover. Yeah. We should have had snow cover. A lot of these creatures are dependent on a layer of snow to be an insulator yeah. so that they don't freeze. And we had lost the snow cover. And then if after we lose snow cover, it gets really cold in the depth of freeze and the ground goes down deeply, mm -hmm. we kill a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so we didn't get that super cold. We never got super cold, really. So I don't think we got a, a big die-off. But we did lose the snow. And this, this pattern of having some snow and then raining and losing the snow and having a little bit of snow and raining it's not what we have co-evolved with here in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. To protect the roots, to protect the soil, to protect the critters, mm -hmm. we'd be having some snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, as the climate warms, we have a creature called the mink frog that requires cold water to get oxygen to its eggs. 
And so as the water warms, the temperature of the water warms, then it gets less oxygen, less dissolved oxygen. And so uh, that one has disappeared from 23% of the towns that it was once in. So that's a concern, mink frog there. But that's unusual in that it's a northern species that reaches into Vermont that may get pushed, pushed out. Of oh, the, the Endangered Species Act, how does that impact uh, a state-based endangered animal? Does it only impact, like, if you were going to develop and you have a red cockaded woodpecker on your, you know, pine plantation, you, you may not be able to harvest that timber because it's a federally endangered species, but what you're talking about is a Vermont endangered species. You're right. Yeah, there's a big distinction. Okay. We have relatively few federally, in, we have no federally endangered reptiles and amphibians. Oh. We have state endangered, which means we can come up with a list, we do this every five, ten years where we rate the different species, species of greatest conservation need, and we rate them. And that allows us to tap into federal monies, if you've done this. So it's federal monies, but it's, allow, it's allowing you to prioritize, the states to prioritize. Now, if we came up with a federally endangered species, there's new buckets of money that would become available, and new restrictions. Vermont, we did get something passed that is very, very rare. And we've made a step forward with it, and that is that we can now list habitat for species as endangered. Before, you could have the bald eagle out there in a tree. You could not shoot that bald eagle, but you could cut the tree down. The habitat, not protected. And now, we are one of the few states where we have actually listed some pieces of habitat that need to be protected in order for the species that live on to persist. We've done that with four. We're very careful with the first four. Very careful not to piss anybody off. You know? And and we get, you know, landowner permission and all that kind of stuff. And so we did that with with nesting beaches for spiny stuff show turtles. We did that for wintering caves for some of our bats. Uh, we did that for um, who else did we do that for? The rattlesnake? Um, did we do some rattlesnake stuff with that one? I'm just thinking for their, where their dens were. Where their dens were? I don't think we did, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we did, we were careful, and, and we did protect some habitat, and, and we didn't get a lot of pushback, and so that's a cool thing, and we can proceed more in that direction, but, um, but frankly, fish and wildlife, Fish and wildlife is an important ally with this stuff. And, and they don't really have all the people and the resources that they need. And that's controlled not by them, but by elected officials. And so if the elected official says, we are not adding any more positions to state government, that's it. Yeah? So if there's a Vermont land trust, yeah. Can there be a Vermont Habitat Trust? Well, it pretty much is. Nature Conservancy. Nature, Nature Conservancy is the one that's most focused on wildlife and, and biodiversity. But you can definitely work with the other land trusts, because they're concerned too. Vermont Land Trust, Rivers Conservancy, the Wilderness, Wilderness Trust. There's a whole bunch of land trusts that are definitely concerned, but some of them are a little bit more focused on forest land, egg land, mm. preserving the farm, that kind of stuff. But they will work with you. I'm doing a lot of work right now with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, mm. NRCS, where they're trying to reclaim what once was farmland and turn it back into wetlands. Mm. And so we're trying to make that wetland support, be able to support reptiles and amphibians. Um, but the conservancy really there mm. is your biggest ally for wildlife conservation in terms of lands. It, they work very closely with Fish and Wildlife. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm the uh, board chairman of uh, the duck stamp money, and we put in over, I think, $2 million into preserving areas sort of like uh, Lemon Fair, uh, 
places on the Champlain Valley. We've done some on the uh, eastern side of the state also. And we've worked very closely with with the Nature Conservancy and the different land trusts. There's, the whole government seems to be pretty good about working together on that type of thing. Yep. And we should mention with that that you can buy habitat stamps from Fish and Wildlife. And, um, you know, if you're not a hunter or a fisherman, then, then you're really not really contributing to uh, Fish and Wildlife. Most of their money comes from traditional sources, hunters and fishermen. There's some that comes from the general fund. But if you buy habitat stamps or the non-game uh, chickadee checkoff when you're, when you're doing your uh, taxes, then that all goes to, to wildlife protection, non-game wildlife protection, habitat. And in addition, groups that you might not think of, like Ducks Unlimited, yeah. mm. uh, Rough Grouse Society, yeah. places like that. I'm right now working with Ducks Unlimited. Really, we're trying to conserve rattlesnakes, but it's Ducks Unlimited, mm. which um, you might not think there was a connection there. But Well, that whole area in Pittsburgh, uh, below Pittsburgh, uh, that was bought by Ducks Unlimited and then transferred out of there, but if they hadn't been there as a vehicle, that never would have been conserved. So. And uh, generally speaking, Nature Conservancy doesn't like to um, hang on to the land. They'll help the arrangement in picking it up, and then they want to transfer it to the state or transfer it to some other holder for the long term. Yeah. Okay, so we're getting past 8.30 here. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to keep everyone up, uh, up too late, but uh, so I guess we could end it right here. Yep. And if uh, you have more questions, Jim will probably hang around for a little bit. Sure. Them and he's got materials, we've got materials. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. It was great to see you.